So in our last video, which you can watch by clicking here, we talked about how hashtags are examples of signs as viewed through the lens of semiotics, which is the study of how we associate signifiers with signifieds. And we also talked about how signs can be appropriated and colonized in a process called myth. So one thing that becomes really clear when you start thinking like a semiotician is that language doesn't just mean stuff, it does stuff too. Language works in different registers and functions in different ways, actually about six ways. More on that later. In a few minutes, we're gonna look at how trolling works by manipulating the functions of language for the laws. But first, we need to think about language and performativity. The concept of linguistic performativity is most often associated with English philosopher J.L. Austin, whose published lectures, collectively known as How to Do Things with Words, contains a famous one called performative utterances, which are quite literally utterances that do what they say by virtue of saying it. There are a lot of simple examples of performatives, Probably the most famous one is in the English wedding ceremony when the officiant says, I now pronounce you man and wife. Also, when you say, I do, to vow your commitment. Anytime you promise something, give something a name, apologize for something, or even accept an apology, these are all performative speech acts because under the right circumstances, as Austin says, quote, the issuing of the utterance is the performing of an action. And the circumstances are important. Just like we saw last video, meaning necessarily exists in a relation to a set of preconditions and already existent cultural conventions. It's the same with performatives. Not just anyone can pronounce two people to be legally married. By the same token, not just anyone can accept an apology for a given act. So there are background conditions that are in place that determine whether a speech act is successfully performative or not. So hold on a second, when we talk about performativity, we might be talking about at least three different registers of language, as I see it. As we've just done, we can talk about the issuing of an utterance as the performing of an action. We can also talk about issuing an utterance as performing or acting upon some targeted object. Thirdly, we can talk about the issuing of an utterance as the enactment of a performance, which can have real effects. Essentially, performance in language is about how our words have an effect on the world or ourselves or other people or not. All three of these registers will come into play when we talk about trolling in a minute. Hey, be patient. So Austin's model takes in utterances that can be verified or falsified as opposed to performatives, which work differently, but it doesn't account for all the ways that we use speech, which brings us to a big long word, multifunctionality. Russian-born linguist Roman Jakobson, following on the heels of Ferdinand de Saussure, developed a really useful system charting six functions of language that describe all the different kinds of work that language does. So all of Jakobson's six functions of language, the expressive, the conative, the referential, the poetic, the phatic, the metalinguistic, are all present in any speech act to varying degrees, but in some cases, one or two may become predominant. Let's see how this works. The expressive function is dominant in an utterance mainly oriented toward the speaker herself, expressing or indexing the speaker's own opinions or emotions. The conative function is dominant in an utterance directed toward the addressee or interlocutor. The referential function is dominant in an utterance primarily referring to a third person or the context or something external to the conversation. The poetic function is dominant in an utterance that calls attention to the sounds and patterns of the message itself, including tropes like rhyme and repetition. The phatic function is dominant in an utterance oriented toward the channel or mode of contact between speaker and addressee, which can be a physical channel or a social one. Finally, the metalinguistic function is dominant in an utterance directed at language itself, engaging in the work of negotiating meaning and defining other utterances. You probably noticed that multiple functions are at play in each of these utterances. Which brings us briefly to trolling. So if you spend time on the social internet, you've probably seen trolling happen. I mean, just scroll down to the comment thread of literally any internet thing. Okay, not, not literally any internet thing, but pretty close. But anyway, we should probably hammer out a rough definition of trolling. Philosopher and literary scholar Whitney Phillips has studied and written about online trolling quite a bit. 
She defines it thus. In a nutshell, trolling in the online sense is a behavioral practice predicated on disruption. It can take many forms from harmless pranks all the way to behaviors that meet the legal definition of harassment. So trolls seek to disrupt, but trolls do this in a particular way. I really like how philosopher Rachel Barney puts it in her periodic essay, Aristotle on Trolling. The troll in the proper sense is one who speaks to a community and as being part of the community, only he is not part of it, but opposed. By this definition, trolling can include being just plain mean, but maybe it doesn't necessarily have to? Rather, the troll uses language performatively and multifunctionally to deceive and disrupt a pre-existing discourse. Maybe to troll is to malevolently play with the functions of language. Think about it. Barney points out that the troll destroys a thread by, quote, disputing what is known to be true or abusing what is recognized as admirable or he creates fear about a small problem as if it were large, or treats a necessary matter as small, or speaks abuse while claiming to be a friend. This kind of trolling performs or enacts membership in a discursive community while undermining it by playing on that community's discursive expectations. This kind of troll leverages multifunctionality to misdirect and deceive, ostensibly using the referential function to talk about something, quote, known to be false or harmful or ignorant, but he does not say that thing, but rather something close, end quote. Barney goes on about what inevitably happens next. She says, quote, in this way, he retains the possibility of denial, and the skilled troll is always surprised and hurt, or it seems to be, when the others take his comments up. And so he sets the community apart from each other and introduces strife where before there was scarcely disagreement. For each person who takes up what was said grasps only a part of it and insists on that and is annoyed when others affirm something different. In this scenario, it's like the troll's speech masks its manipulation of the channel of communication by using the referential function. And then when challenged on the facts, the referential aspect of what they said or the metalinguistic way that they said it, they start pulling strings on the conative and expressive functions of language to stir up emotion. They're just doing it for the lulls, or, hey, don't be so thin-skinned. I'd be interested to hear what you think about how performance and multifunctionality and trolling all intersect. Is there anything to this theory? In any case, it becomes clear that multifunctionality can explain what happens when people perform precise, deliberate, perhaps destructive actions even if on the surface, their words don't give it away. Well, that ends this three-part series introducing the literary field of semiotics. Thanks for tuning in. And wow, much amazed at all the people that have paid attention to the last two videos in this series. I personally tip my hat off to the Lit Crit guy on Twitter for helping me promote it there. You should definitely check him out if you want smart thoughts on a regular basis about literary theory and philosophy. He does a regular hashtag theory time session most weeks. Uh, definitely check him out. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo. Also some extra material in the doobly-doo down near the bottom if you want more food for thought about how semiotics applies to the social internet and lots of other stuff. Uh, things that I read in preparation for these videos but just didn't have the time or space to cover. If you enjoyed this video, now would be a great time to subscribe. Thanks for watching.